This lecture will be about practical noise index optimizations at the scanner console. My name is Lior Mulvin. I come from Stanford Healthcare. Now this lecture starts as all investigations start with a Google search. And if you start your Google search with a royalty free exposure control search, you'll find pictures of streakers and flashers. You'll find disease maps across the world. You'll see biohazard signs, CCD shutters, more biohazard signs, celebrities that wanna be paid for me to show their faces, and eventually you'll get to an AEC topic. And that's what we're gonna to cover today. Now, the learning objective is straightforward. We wanna figure out how to perform patient size specific exposure settings. We'll do this by demonstrating how the systems work. And if we can understand noise and centering and automated tube current modulation systems, we can then apply that knowledge to create workflow specific applications. Specifically, we can create a size specific exposure setting table that I'll share with you, as well as we can create a patient size specific protocol design. I'll show you some system specific granularities as well. So let's begin with noise, because if you can identify what image noise is and how we can measure this, then will you understand why and how we use automated tube current modulation systems. So here's a picture of a region of interest. That's this green circle. It's an ROI and it's measuring the density of the object. In this case, it's measuring the density of an iodine enhanced a contrast enhanced aorta. Now, the density of that is the Hounsfield value. In this case, it's 562, and the standard deviation of that Hounsfield is 29. And the standard deviation reflects the accuracy of the Hounsfield value. So every pixel that does not represent 562 Hounsfields doesn't really represent the anatomy, and it can be considered part of the noise. And Usually we look at images with a wide window, but if we narrow that window down, we can see all of these false positives, which are white, those aren't bones, and we can see these false negatives, which are black, that's not air. Those are pixels that don't represent the patient's anatomy. And noise distributes uh, essentially in a very uh, reproducible pattern here. This is uh, the bell curve, and the way that you can uh, use this to understand how the imaging works is that when you take all of your pixels, a majority of them will align with this central structure. So um, most of them are in the middle. And then uh, as you move far from the middle, you have less and less pixels. So uh, one standard deviation away, you might have 85% of your pixels and three standard deviations away, you may have 90%, 99% of your pixel values in this example. And so the farther you are from that central area, the more standard deviations away from that central area, uh, the more uh, the pixel is far away from the actual density of the object and not representing the average of the object. So here's an example of uh, two uh, curves. Uh, these could be two measurements. Uh, specific to your image, and they both have the same average density, but the one that's blue is actually going to have uh, less noise and more of the pixels are going to be condensed towards that average area, whereas the one that's in orange, uh, that one's going to have pixels that, far, that fall a little bit farther away from that average value. And so you can see this in your image. For example, uh, the blue one could be a thick slice image, maybe a five millimeter cut, whereas the uh, yellow one and the orange one, that might be like a 2.5 millimeter cut. Or the blue one may have a lot of iterative reconstruction and the uh, orange one would be a traditional filtered back projection. And so essentially what this is showing you is that one of these images will be noisier than the other. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that noise is not really uniform. It might look like the same color gray, but if you were actually create a line through uh, pixel counter and measure the Hounsfield value per pixel, you could see that there is quite a bit of variation within your object. And so while you might get an average value, it is susceptible to artifact 
Um, and so generally speaking, when you place your ROI, you want it to be large enough that it samples a, a piece of your, uh, a large enough portion of your object so that it can't be uh, falsely triggered or give you a false positive or a false negative because it's not representing uh, the true object itself. So noise and recon kernels. Let's start with uh, this picture here. Uh, they both measure the exact same Hounsfield value. The mean value is 95 in both cases. Uh, the image that's grainier has a noise value of 129, whereas the image that is less grainy uh, actually has a noise value of 21, right? And so why do we do this? Well, if you look at the noisy image, it has better border detail, so you have better edge preservation. Generally speaking, for high contrast structures, that's where you want noisy uh, images or where you can tolerate noisy images. And so for bone imaging, when you're looking at bone and comparing it to its surrounding structure, there's a huge Hounsfield variation there, and that allows you to visualize that. Same with lungs. We generally use sharp reconstruction kernels for lungs. Uh, and then for the smoother kernels where you want low noise, when are those appropriate? Well, if you're looking at low contrast structures, like in this example, we're looking at the liver. You could be looking at uh, the brain parenchyma, um, body organs, generally speaking, those are low contrast structures and they require less noise. And in terms of 3D kernels, um, or kernels that are appropriate for 3D, the sharp kernels may offer you better edge detail, but the false positives uh, and the false negatives may get into your segmentation algorithm and start to give you ghosting. And so you can, in this case, see the sharp kernel. Actually, you can see the outline of the ears where these individual pixels, they're just popping up left and right. Um, and in this example, we have a surgeon that wants to know, well, what does the skull look like? Is the swelling going down? How am I going to map this out? How am I going to put the rest of the skull back together now that uh, we're done with the swelling? So this is a really good example of when you want less noise. So 3D reconstructions, MIPS, generally speaking, you want lower noise values. And noise and slice thickness is a very important topic. here. So these are the exact same image. The 625 millimeter has better spatial resolution, but it has tremendous noise. Five millimeter loses that spatial resolution due to vol partial volume averaging, but it has better noise characteristics. Now these are actually the same image. The only difference is that when you have your uh, thin cut, uh, you can essentially take multiple ones of those and create what's called a volume slab, and then you can average uh, the uh, Hounsfield values. Uh, through the plane to get your images. And the reason there's less noise is because the noise is random. And so it might be in a different place at each one of these 65 millimeter cuts. And then once you average all of them out, you lose that noise over time. So the GE scanners will allow the user to choose the level of acceptable noise in the recon one of any protocol using their auto MA or smart MA functions. Now on the older systems, what that meant was that your first reconstruction had a specific slice thickness, and you would assume that you were using a standard reconstruction kernel. And whatever noise value you had, the MA would go up or down to try and reach that noise target. On the Revolution systems, it's a little bit more advanced, and so now uh, the Revolution will account for a high res mode. If you're using an HD kernel, it will increase the exposure because the HD kernels and the high res modes tend to have more noise. And then the ACER-V value will be taken into account. So if you have zero ACER-V, it won't take anything into account. But if you have 100% ACER-V, it will give you a tremendous radiation dose reduction. So the HD kernel uh, and the ACER-V value play a significant role in your exposure settings and your noise index and the, the MA selection the system is going to provide in addition to the slice thickness of the first reconstruction. In addition to that, you want to think about this noise index being the target which causes your MA to fluctuate within the time-oriented scan parameters. Uh, and the time-oriented scan parameters are pitch and rotation. You're going to have to adjust those accordingly to reach your noise target because this is an MA modulator, not an MAS modulator. And another really important thing to keep in mind is the MA is going to fluctuate based on the patient's size, 
from the last scout. Okay, not the first scout, no, both scouts, just the last scout. Here's an example of that. So we have an AP scout uh, using a five millimeter reconstruction one with a noise index value of 13.08. And the uh, exposure is approximately 11 milligram. And you can see that I've chosen my scan range to include the entire anthropomorphic phantom. Uh, whenever you're planning your scan range, you want your uh, image or your scout to cover these magenta lines. Those are the actual scan lines, the amount of projections required to reconstruct at the region that's selected in your reconstruction. So the blue lines are your reconstruction, but the scans are generally going to be above or below that. So make sure you have your scout including there. So in an AP scout with these settings, we get 11 milligray and in a lateral scout, the exact same settings, we get 13 uh, 0.94 milligray. So essentially we can either do 11 milligray or 14 milligray for the exact same noise index value, which means that the last scout really matters and you need to orient your protocols to reflect whatever that last scout may be. So if you want to use an AP or PA, uh, just make sure to do that consistently. If you want to do a lateral every time, do that consistently. Correlate your noise index value in the protocol with the scout direction. So in the early years of automated tube current modulation, we had AutoMA. And AutoMA is a great tool. This is how it works. Uh, it does two things. The first thing is that after you scout, it's going to recognize whether your patient is small or large. It's going to give larger patients more MA and smaller patients less MA. In addition to that, it's going to perform what's called Z-axis modulation. It's going to identify that there are density and width changes of your patient from head to toe. And you can see that here in this uh, lower image where we have a high MA value and then it goes down through the neck and then up through the shoulders and then down through the lungs and up through the abdomen, up through the pelvis and then back down through the legs. OK, so this is a really important thing to keep in mind. Z-axis modulation will adapt to the object density changes and the system will be able to identify for patients larger or smaller than average. And the advantage to this. Uh, method are great because you could essentially have completely different MAS values uh, for uh, for wide areas like the lungs here uh, compared to uh, narrow areas like the the neck here and this offers you a great opportunity to reduce radiation dose to your patient uh, and in, in the old days uh, you had to program an MAS value for your CT scanner and use that for the entire range. And so we don't have to do that anymore. Now, AutoMA is kind of a, a relic of the past. Now we're using SmartMA, which gives us XYZ modulation. Essentially what that means is as the X-ray tube rotates around the patient, it's gonna recognize that you're gonna have different attenuation values from the anterior posterior projections compared to the lateral projections. And it's going to give you essentially four exposure values as it rotates around the patient. And the newer systems offer a tool called organ dose modulation. It'll, it'll be called smart MA with ODM. And in this case, it will reduce the anterior uh, exposure compared to the lateral exposure and compared to the posterior exposure and uh, the subsequent lateral exposure. So you can actually get three different exposure values. Well, why would you want to do this? Well, let's say you're imaging pediatrics and you want to reduce the entrance uh, exposure to uh, a female's chest area, or you want to reduce uh, the exposure to the lens of the eye. This can be meaningful. Siemens has this on their systems as well. That product is called Xcare. So why are we using this automated tube current modulation? Well, for one, we can reduce exposure when it isn't needed. Right, we can standardize the noise characteristics in the entire Z range, and we can extend the X-ray tube life to maintain uptime and uh, facilitate uh, efficiency in our operations. So automated tube current modulation is pretty straightforward. We're balancing MA values with image quality. We're using the exposure control system to create noise suppression. And that's really important when you're trying to create patient size specific exposure settings. Uh, MAS and noise are very quantitative and that's very easy to do. It's simple algebra. Unfortunately, image quality is not simple algebra, it's subjective. And so there are 
cases where for similar study types, you, you could have different size patients uh, that require completely different noise settings. For example, take obese patients that have adipose separating their organs. Well, that's going to allow us to visualize better compared to thin patients where the organs are compressed against each other and the noise will be really damaging uh, if it's too high in thin patients. And also there are the, the reader's biases where readers don't agree on what an optimal image quality is. Think about a peds thoracic radiologist versus an adult body radiologist uh, where they just wouldn't see eye to eye on what an acceptable image quality is going to be. It's important to keep in mind on GE system, your noise settings must be altered as slice stinks changes for dose neutral imaging. Um, and this is whether or not you're using the noise index system. If you use your noise index and you type in 11 noise index and you change to a 625, the system is going to recommend a higher noise value. It might re recommend like a 25 or a 30 noise index value. And if you're in manual MA and you have a five millimeter cut and it's at 400 uh, MA and then you change it to 625, the system might recommend 1000 MA because that's what it would require to give you similar noise characteristics. So be mindful of changing your first reconstruction parameter and consider ignoring the first reconstruction parameter and doing all of your uh, optimizations on subsequent recons or in retrospective or retro recon in order to reduce the variability in to your exposures. So how does a CT scanner measure your patient size? Well, it does it a few ways. Uh, generally speaking, it's always going to use your scout images or your topograms. It's going to look at the width and the density of the scout images, right? And a Siemens system is going to use the pictures, both pictures. You give them two pictures, they'll use those two. You give them three, they'll use all three. It's going to use all of the information from every topogram to calculate the patient size, while the GE systems are only going to use the last scout. We talked about this earlier. And this has some implications, right? The patient must be perfectly centered. Magnification will change your dose considerably. And for the noise index chart that I'm going to share with you, our noise index settings are based on attenuation profiles for AP scouts at zero angles. Uh, you could use 180 degrees as well, which would be a PA scout. So centering and magnification. So imagine your objects close to the source and far from the detector, it will appear larger because of the inverse square law. And we can do the same thing where we take that uh, object, we bring it really close to the detector, we image it, and it will have less magnification because it's closer to the, the actual source and uh, closer to the, um, to the plate of, that you're imaging on. Now, in this uh, phantom example, we use a noise index value of six, so that's our noise target that we would expect to measure at five millimeters. And the green uh, box in the middle, that's isocentered. That gives me 63 milligrave for a 16 centimeter phantom. And it gives me a noise value of 5.9. So right on track, the system did exactly what I asked it for. I asked it for a noise value of six. I got a noise value of six. What was the cost? 63.33 milligrave. Now, if you look at the patient or the, the object that was close to the source and far from the detector, in orange, you can see it's magnified, it's larger, it's getting me 80.5 milligray, which is 27% over the exposure that I got for my well center phantom, and a noise value of 4.5, so well below the noise value that I requested, right? And then conversely, for the uh, object that has the blue labels, I scanned this one with the topogram really close to the detector about four centimeters lower than center. And this gave me 21% under exposure with 50 milligray and the noise value was seven, so higher than I asked for, right? So this is doesn't have enough exposure and then the orange one has too much, but the green one, that's just right. And there are implications for this because all of your patients require optimal centering in order to get size specific settings. Here's a Barbie doll that we scanned really close to the uh, source and really close to the detector. One of them is large and wide. The other one is way too thin. It's the same size object, but look at the dose delta, right? We can either get 13 milligray uh, for the patient that was way too, uh, way too far away from the detector, uh, or we can get the uh, three milligray for the patient that was as close to the detector as possible, right? So the system's not actually measuring the patient size 
at all, it's more susceptible to off-centered uh, opportunities to change the exposure setting and not understand what the patient size is. So we decided to identify a pathway to correlate your noise index value with your patient size to get a specific exposure setting. And this is how we started. We took about 100 patients and we performed a lateral scalp. We turned the grid on and then we identified the ISO center of the gantry. We then measured the farthest uh, distance from the liver, from the anterior uh, abdomen all the way to the posterior back. We cut that in half and that gave us the patient's ISO center. And we subsequently moved that uh, the table height, the difference between the patient ISO center to the gantry center, and then we performed our AP scalp. So what did we find? Well, we found on average uh, that when we tried to do this for small, medium, and large patients, we were off by 22 millimeters, 11 millimeters, and 18 millimeters. We also found that uh, doing that on every patient was not um, a workable workflow. So we scratched our heads for a bit. Eventually, we identified a pathway, which was if we averaged the center and compared it uh, to um, the difference uh, for that patient, if I took all of the patients um, that were uh, in this bin and I averaged out the actual center after I moved them, that was 123 millimeters, and that was only off by six millimeters every time. And so I did that for... Uh, average size patients as well. So I was able to reduce the variability from 11 millimeters to seven millimeters. And then for large patients, we were able to uh, reduce our variability from 18 millimeters to eight millimeters just by using this table height of 167 millimeters. And the basic rule here is that for every uh, 50 pound increase of patient size, you can move your patient down approximately two centimeters. And so here's the first version of our lookup table we developed in 2013, where we had our patient size uh, bin, and then we'd identify the table height associated with that. We type in our noise index value, if it was standard uh, exposure or low dose exposure, and that would correspond roughly to the CTDI milligrade value. Uh, so these would be the noise index or standard deviation values of Recon 1, and then these would be the exposures that would correlate to that for the different patient size groups. And we would do this for several systems. So we had some systems that were able to reconstruct uh, scan at 625 for Recon 1 and some that only had 5 millimeters. And so while the noise value is different, the dose targets are exactly the same. They are identical. So uh, since we created this um, mechanism, uh, GE has also created a workaround, which is uh, for you to take a lateral scout, then the machine will automatically tell you where the middle point of that patient is and recommend uh, moving your table to that table height with this orange line. This only pops up when you're off-centered. And then you can move it to this area and then perform your AP scout. I uh, will say we have some, had some issues with this uh, in which uh, patients over-scouted. And so imagine your head and your arms are in this scout range. It's gonna include that in the attenuation profile. Uh, we've had issues with neck CTs where uh, the density profile of the head changes dramatically with the chest because the chest was included and it's caused people to center incorrectly there as well. So be mindful that you only can scout what you intend to scan if you wanna use this tool. But it's a great tool and we use it often. Now, here's an example of a patient uh, who's in the same table height with two different exposure values just because of his arm position. So one of our, technologies, our technologists, Zach Boucher, did this, uh, and he did a really good job of identifying that he didn't think that the patient's arm position was acceptable, so he repositioned the table and to the exact same scan ranges. We got 18.7 milligray uh, in our first try, and then 10 milligray was what the system was recommending in our second try. Well, why did this happen? Well, it's this region right here. Take a look at the projections that the x-rays will have to go through. Not only is this a denser object that you'll need more x-rays for, but you can see that it's actually projecting through and it's going to magnify because the patient's uh, center is over here and this is all the way up here. So it really pays to reduce the variability and, and the magnification in your scalp pictures. And so this is a really great example of uh, what you can do by just optimizing your scan parameters and your uh, your patient positioning. 
So what noise index setting will reach my CTDI target, right? Because even with proper centering, there's no one patient size specific noise index setting. It just, it doesn't work. Um, and we have to think about dose as a quality metric too. It's not just the end noise of the image. If, you, if you're practicing Alara and image gentle, uh, gently and image wisely, and you look at the ACR and the APM, they all have recommendations for, for exposure thresholds. They're all looking at, well, what's the right exposure for your patient? And there are ways to do this. Um, here's an example of how the Siemens automated tube current modulation system works. This system is called Keratos 4D. And in the protocol, what you do is you type in the reference point, in this case, an MAS value, a reference MAS value that's used for average size patients. And then the system will recognize if your patients are smaller and give less MAS or larger and give you more MAS, but it's curved and that's really important. If you look at the newer systems, uh, not only do they allow you to adjust the way this curve interacts with your patient, you can have a strong curve, a weak curve. You can interact differently with slim patients and obese patients. You can interact differently with pediatric patients. And these contrast a lot with the constant image noise, image noise um, uh, method, which is the GE technique, which is constant noise. And you can see for the same size patient, uh, GE will give you more exposure for large patients and less exposure for small patients because it's very linear. So here are our target dose reference values. The ACR pass-fail criteria uh, is set to 30 milligram, which means that if you turn in an image uh, for accreditation and it's greater than 30 milligram, you fail right off the bat. So generally speaking, your exposures for your average size patients should never really be at 30 milligram. This is an upper range. And we found another area that was of concern, which is that five milligray region where we were getting physician complaints. The images were too noisy. They were uninterpretable. So we wanted to stay above five and below 30. So we had this 25 milligray area to work with. And this was our goal for all of our patients. And so what we did was we took this 30 milligray, we cut it in half, we did some image quality subjective tests, the radiologists liked them, and that became our baseline exposure. We added five milligray for large patients and took away five milligray for smaller patients. And for, um, for simplicity's sake, we had two acquisitions, we had the standard exposure settings and we had the low dose exposure settings, which are one half of the standard, right above that point of physician complaint, right? So this gives us that opportunity to really kind of live on that Alara uh, seesaw where we're just there doing uh, as much as we can to reduce the radiation dose of the patients without degrading our image quality. And so we also have these pass-fail criteria thresholds that we have uh, posted in all of our scanners where they're for adult protocols. We can say don't go above uh, 65 milligray for a 16 centimeter phantom or 30 milligray for a 32 centimeter phantom for adult head exam types. Adult body as well, we have a 16 centimeter phantom, a 32 centimeter phantom, perfusion studies, we have some pediatrics, and then we also have average exposure settings, which we use uh, to best help people identify what the exposure should be. So if you have a 150 pound patient and you have a, a, a standard exposure setting, it should be between this range. And if it's low dose, it should be within this range. And so we're giving people the information that they would need so that they can say, well, wow, that CTDI does not look right for that exam type and that patient body size. And we've asked our technologists to, to reach out to the radiologist if the scanner is going to recommend going over these thresholds and get the approval and document that approval in EPIC. And that represents about 1% of our scans tend to fall up above that region. And so here is just a graphical evaluation of what we just saw. So the average exposure ranges are these blue lines. The uh, low dose uh, are going to be right here. Patient size on the horizontal axis. My thresholds are in red. This is pediatric less than 55 kilograms, pediatric greater than 55 kilograms. And then over here, we have the adult body threshold. And we're trying to keep all of our exposure settings linear and in between these and not super steep. So in order to identify what exposure corresponded to a noise value. We took those same 100 patients we showed you earlier, uh, and we optimized the technical factors. So we used 120 kV pitch, 
of one four, rotation of one second in the scan range of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. We typed in the noise index value and wrote down the exposure that it would recommend for that given patient size. We didn't actually perform these exams this many times, but we just typed these in uh, for one patient. We would type in noise index of 20, type down the, the 13 milligray, type in 25, type in the 8, and then basically map it out from top to bottom with five noise index increments for small, average, and large patient sizes. We made sure our MA tables were fluctuating, and so the system was showing us the exposure that it was recommending for those noise index values. And this is essentially what we found, is that if you wanted to get 10 milligray for a small patient, you need a noise index of 23 for these technical factors. And for a patient, if you wanted to get a noise index of uh, 33 to give you 15 milligray uh, with these technical factors, that would work. And if you wanted 20 milligray, then 43 would get you there with these technical factors. There's the pattern. In fact, um, this, is, this is the objective, right? So these are those uh, separate curves, and these are the recommendations. And so here we have CTDI on the vertical axis, noise index on the horizontal axis. I have my three patients, small, medium, and large in blue, and then my uh, exposure setting that I'm trying to achieve my size-specific exposure target which is my goal. So for my small patient, if I was to use a noise index of 20, uh, for this patient, I would have gotten 10 milligrams. That's perfect. If I use that 20 on my average size patient, I would have failed accreditation. My large patient, definitely failed accreditation. Way above threshold, way more than I need for my average patient and my uh, large patient. If I look at my large patient, if I use a noise index value of 55, I can get to that 20 milligram value. However, if I use that on my average or my small patient, well, then I get awfully close to that point of physician complaint, right? And then even that average size patient, and this is where most protocols are built. You build it for the average size patient, and then you see what the recommendation is. And you can see here, if I use that same noise index value of 33, I'd get 40 uh, plus milligray on the large patient, and I'd get close to five milligray on the small patient. So I'd get a physician complaint, it's too noisy, and then and and then ordering physician patient complaint, you over radiated me, right? And so what's the proper noise index value? Uh, well, based on this data, anywhere between 20 and 60 uh, noise index, that's, that's the value that you would have to use in your protocol. And that's not super meaningful, uh, especially if you keep in mind that the noise index scale is zero, either zero to 70 on the older systems or zero to 85 on the newer systems. That's the entire scale. Right. So how do you create some actionable information from this? Well, one way to do it is the way our physicist did it, which was that if you just type in a noise index value and type down there matching uh, CTDIs, it's really easy to calculate what noise index would correspond to the uh, exposure setting that it would provide. It's very, very easy to do. Uh, so you could build an Excel calculator that would do this for you. Right. One thing to keep in mind is that your noise index is uh, not linear, it's logarithmic, and it scatters accordingly. And so on our vertical axis, we have milligray CTDI, and on our horizontal axis, we have our noise index. It says 1 to 100, but really it stops at 85. You can see there are no plots here at 100. And let's just take a look at a few of these values. So the third value that I have is a noise index of 7, gives me 66 milligray and a noise index of 11 gives me 30 milligram, right? So twice the exposure for a change of four. You take that same change from 52, I get 1.86 milligray, and 55, I get 1.79 milligray, right? So these are essentially the same number and a similar spread, right? So what that means is that you'll wanna build your protocols here where the noise index is less sensitive. Over here, subtle changes or failures to change will cause massive overexposures. And down here, uh, there really is no reason to change your exposure. It's not really gonna do much for you. So you'll wanna build your protocols from here whenever possible. So it's not so sensitive that if you forget to change it, it will fail and it will give you meaningful exposure results. And here's an example of a pancreas that was done with and without optimized AEC at the time we were doing non-contrast uh, abdomens for all of our pancreatic studies. The, this is the same patient, 
uh, we, we did an arterial phase, a portal venous chest down and pelvis in a delayed phase. On the optimized exam, we had 1,000 milligray. On the non-optimized exam, we had 3,300 milligray. Let's take a look at one of the pictures. We'll go to the arterial phase where we used 30 milligray in the unoptimized, non-optimized exam and 6.6 milligray in the optimized exam. Now, both images look good, but I'm not sure that the 30 milligray looks five times better. So there's not a lot of value in exposing at high uh, values here. You know, you want to reduce the dose as much as possible and get to that Alara principle, right? Size-specific exposure settings needs to apply every time. We never want this to happen. We always want to have a patient with a similar size and a, and a similar disease process and a similar protocol to get a similar exposure setting and similar image quality. Both images are good. The image quality is not the problem. The exposures and the lack of optimization is the problem. Right, so here's our current uh, a, a current uh, lookup table that we use, one for our VCTs and our 750s at 625, one for our PET CTs uh, that's at five millimeters. Uh, we have four groups now, and we've separated the full exposure with the low-dose exposures. So we can use the low-dose exposures for non-cons and renal delays and uh, renal stones, and we can use the full dose for portal venous phase imaging and the cardiovascular uh, acquisitions, that sort of thing. So we have four groups, 150 to greater than 260, four table heights, type in this noise index value, make sure that your exposure is within that range. And again, it's the same as the five millimeter table. The noise index value changes dramatically, but the uh, actual exposure is the same. Why do we use a five millimeter versus a 625? Well, some older systems still only have three reconstructions and all of them have to go out to the radiologist for readouts. So you, sometimes you, you get stuck with having to use these five millimeter cuts. But as long as your technologist knows what the exposure target is, it's not a huge deal. So let's take a look at uh, workflow. We'll do a use case scenario. We have a larger patient, a young male, he's 215 pounds, and we need to do uh, a routine abdomen and pelvis with contrast. Uh, we have two acquisitions for ours, a standard dose uh, portal venous phase and a low dose um, renal delay. So we'll, we'll find the patient's size, we'll map the table height, we'll perform our scout, we'll type in a noise index value of 38, and we should get somewhere between this 13 and 22 milligray, and as long as it's there, we're good to go. We'll then go ahead and move forward with our delays. The delays come from the low dose section. And so we'll type in a 54 and that should get us somewhere between six and 12 milligray. And as long as it's there, we're all set. If your CTDI is outside of the target range, simply adjust the noise index value. The noise index is not the target. So uh, this might say a hard finite 38 noise index value, but this could be a 36, it could be a 40, it could be a 35 be a 42. It doesn't matter. It's the CTDI range that we're looking at. We're looking at size-specific exposure settings. So how do you check your reference CTDI? Well, here's an example of the older platform. I'm using this one because there's more of these on the market than the Revolution. So the dose information is here. And here's a blow-up of it. You're going to look at your CTDI. This is the average exposure, all of your scheme parameters, your KV, your rotation, your pitch, your uh, filter, um, everything essentially is summed up into an average here. And so this is what you're going to use to identify whether or not you're in the right range. And this is how you turn on your noise index and your smart MA. So auto MA is here. So this is going to give your patient size specific um, exposure. So large or small patients. It's also going to give your Z axis modulation if you turn on your auto MA. And then if you turn on your smart MA, it's going to give you your X, Y, Z modulation. It's going to give you your rotational element. Now, the way that you want to read this is that your, your MA is going to increase as your patient size increases. And here's an example of what we see on our Siemens interface. Where you have your scout and you have your MA profile and it goes up and it goes down. And GE will give you that same thing in this MA table. And this MA table will turn yellow on newer softwares 
to allow you to identify that it is not fluctuating uh, on the upper parameter. You're scanning too fast. It doesn't have enough MAS and you're not going to reach your noise target. So your MA table is located here. Here's a blow up of it and it's right above your scan parameters. So your MA table is the same thing as this green histogram. And reading the MA table is pretty straightforward. You want to think about it in terms of where your scan range is, and then you can equate it to your patient size. So if you're not modulating in the middle, likely you have a patient vase-like shape where they're just rounder in the middle. Uh, we also see the opposite where we have hourglass patients where they're wider in the shoulders and in the hips and more narrow in the middle where we're not modulating in the middle. Okay. So. How do we read these MA tables? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's going to give you your scan direction. So uh, anterior left, posterior right. Uh, if it does have ODM, the anterior and the posterior might be different. But in this case, they're exactly the same, right? So uh, this could be the same as your X and Y in your older systems. And if you're just using auto MA, you'll just get one number here. Now, these groups, one, two, three, four, are basically your detector coverage multiplied by your pitch. So four centimeters or 40 millimeters times 1.375 equals 55 millimeters. So I have four 55 millimeter groups, in other words, 220 millimeters scan range. Now, in order to reach your target MA, you have to fluctuate between your minimum and maximum MA range in your protocol. Now, if your MA table is showing you that you're only at the minimum value, so it says 50 from top to bottom, your scan is too slow, you're overrating your patient, you're overexposing uh, for that noise index target, and if your MA table is stuck at the maximum, you'll get that yellow MA table uh, signal, and you're scanning too fast, you're potentially not getting enough exposure to reach your noise index target. Now, only when your MA fluctuates between this minimum and maximum value in your MA table will you reach that image quality target that you've prescribed in your noise index. Your noise index does not necessarily equal your patient exposure. Here's an example of a noise index of 0 0.5 with 140 kV, a 0.5 pitch, and a one rotation giving me a whopping 155 milligray for a 32 centimeter phantom. That's an enormous number for a non-perfusion scan. And then you've got that exact same noise index of 0 0.5, but now I'm using an 80 kV, an interpolated pitch of 1.5, a rotation of 0 0.4, and I can barely make 5 milligray. So just because the noise index setting is in there doesn't mean you're getting to the right noise target. It's not automatic. It's not smart MA. It's an MA modulator. Okay. These are limited by scan times. If your scan times are not accurate, your modulation system will not work correctly. It's a MA modulator, not a time modulator, not an MAS modulator. So here's the workflow in, in our practice. Uh, your patient will arrive, we'll know uh, their patient size uh, before they get on the table. So we'll use that table height and we'll perform our scout image and then we'll perform our, um, our scan range, we'll apply that, we'll type in our noise index value, and we'll double, we'll double check our MA table. It looks like it's not fluctuating. We'll reference where it's not fluctuating. In this case, everywhere it's not fluctuating, we're going way too fast. We're gonna have to slow things down. So you can reduce your pitch from 1.3 all the way down to 0 0.5. You can increase your rotation from 0 0.5 all the way to one second. Then, you can use your MA table tool, your little check mark, and to see if your MA table is fluctuating. Now it's fluctuating between the minimum and maximum values. I'm almost there. I can correlate the CTDI and the dose information to the target range, and I am good to go. A lot of places don't do that, right? A lot of places have multiple protocols and their size specific protocols. Uh, University of Wisconsin offers these in partnership with GE. They work really well. Uh, essentially what you do is you have a, a noise index value for a small patient and you increase uh, your noise index and decrease your scan time so you can build up more MAS as you get larger. Uh, and we also recommend adjusting your centering so that you can get the proper magnification optimization as you go the larger protocols. Now, for us, we don't do this because uh, 
frankly, we have close to 100 to 200 protocols per scanner and we have 20 scanners. Uh, that's already a massive number. If we had to multiply that by four, it would be very cumbersome to optimize when we need to fine tune and make changes and to access the systems. Uh, it would just take a, long, a lot longer. Uh, and from a managerial perspective, it's, it's not feasible. So having the chart seemed a reasonable opportunity for us to not only identify how to get size specific exposure settings, but to teach technologists the appropriate scan mechanism so that they could find if there are errors uh, in the protocol and optimize accordingly because they have dose targets that they've been empowered with. So let's take a quick look at some results. This is what it looks like. I've got my CTDI on the primary vertical axis. I have my patient size in pounds on the horizontal axis, and I have my noise index setting on the secondary vertical axis. In the green triangle, I have my noise index setting, and I have a corresponding blue circle for every noise index setting that is my CTDI for a single energy CT. Now, what you can see here is that the uh, exposure settings are very linear. As patient size increases, so does, um, so does the exposure value, but it's very controlled and it follows this line very well. Now, interestingly enough, you can see where the protocol worked, where these triangles really line up very well. This is great, right? These were protocol value. These were protocol value. These were protocol value. These were protocol value. But then look at all of these stragglers that are all over the place. And we want that, right? Because look at this guy here. This is not one of our protocol values, noise index of 23, but that's what it took to get me a exposure value of approximately 25 milligram for my large patient. So this is a very, very good approach to noise index optimization. Take a look at these two guys that are scattered completely together. So this is a patient that's 300 pounds, there's two of them, one right above the other. And the exact same noise index setting of 17 gives me 20 milligram for this patient and 26 for this one. So it's a huge change just for the same size patient, right? So you want to keep in mind that using the same noise index isn't always going to correspond to the same exposure settings to your patient. But the goal is to have a very linear controlled exposure change as your patients get larger or smaller, the noise index corresponds to that and subsequently the dose which is the most important part matches uh, our our charts our technique charts that recommend exposure settings so there are additional things that we found out while building our protocols some head scratchers that i'm going to share with you uh, the first is that on leg cge systems a change in pitch causes your noise index to reach a new ctdi even when your ma tables are fluctuating what do I mean by this? Well, we did this with patients. We did this with the phantom. We'll start with the phantom uh, where we use a noise index of 27 and a 65 millimeter um, uh, slice thickness. For the exact same uh, value, a change in pitch gave me 10 milligray when I used a 0.5, gave me 15 milligray uh, when I used a pitch of one and gave me 13 milligray when I used a pitch of 1.4. And so this shows that there's a huge dose reduction just by using a pitch of 0.5 or 1.4. The problem with using a pitch of 0.5 was that this tends to give you artifact if your patients are moving or if they're breathing, pediatrics, Parkinson's, uh, mentally delayed patients. They don't respond well to these ultra slow scan times where you're taking a picture in that same area twice with a redundant pitch. So we found that a pitch of 1.4 works for pretty much everyone giving us access to 55 millimeters per rotation. And so we're taking that 1.5 to 2.5 dose reduction per noise index value, right? So another thing that we found that was interesting was on the Revolution CT, when we're using the helical mode and we compare that to the smart collimation wide detector mode, uh, these are some results. And so. This was uh, the exam that was done on our HD 750, and then we got the new Revolution, and we used the wide detector system, and the average MA was higher. And if you look at these uh, localizer profiles, these are essentially the attenuation profiles or the density of the object. Look on the HD how well the MA, which is this blue line, how well it maps and tracks and predicts 
when the patient's going to get larger and adjusts accordingly. It follows the patient density very, very well. And if you look at the revolution, it really doesn't, right? Because you're using these wide detector blocks. Essentially, these are several fixed MA technique values. And so while on the HD, we had a chance to reduce the dose gradually as the ob object size changed, here we don't have that, right? So we have to increase the dose for this region that isn't really appropriate. And the same thing that's happening here. Instead of ramping up slowly and then back down, we have to cap it and use a dose that's, that's appropriate to maintain image quality for this bucket. And when you superimpose these, it turns out that it's not necessarily worth it. Just because you have a wide detector doesn't mean you should use it. Uh, we decided to use a helical mode with a pitch of uh, a one and a detector configuration of eight centimeters, which makes it faster, uh, dramatically faster than the HDs and the VCTs, but allows us to follow the attenuation profile so we can get similar noise characteristics and exposure settings for those noise values. And here's another interesting thing that we found, which was the fixed noise index on the Revolution CT without using the KV assist feature uh, had some changes when we adjusted the KV while maintaining a fluctuating MA table, we got completely different NCTDI values. And so if you take a look at these two pictures at the far end of the spectrum, I've got my 70 KEV, my 120, my 140, and they all have approximately the same noise value, approximately 13, 14, 15 noise index value, or noise value, um, which is strange, right? Because the CTDIs are, you know, three, seven, or eight, and the, the texture changes a lot. There may be the same number of standard deviations in this 70 compared to this 140, but the 140 looks better. It's sharper, the kernels are smaller, these 70s are blotchy, they're larger. So there's some weird stuff going on here where your noise pattern changes a lot. And this is very different from our older systems, which always gave you a similar CTDI regardless of the energy, which really allowed us to optimize the exposure based on uh, the beam hardening characteristics or the iodine uh, concentration signal that we wanted to achieve, right? So we could scan an obese patient with 80 kV, or we could scan a thin patient with 140 kV and get the same CTDI value with a given noise index system. That's not going to happen with this new system. So to conclude, patient size specific exposure settings are possible. You can do this. Uh, GE has created a very effective MA modulator, but it's not an MAS modulator. The time modulator is going to be the tech or uh, it's going to be the protocol. You'll have to leverage patient size specific protocol values in order to make this work. Uh, AutoMA and SmartMA tools work very well, but they were, require some tech workflow standardizations, of which are centering optimizations and scan time optimizations. And with this, I thank you very much for your time.